I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, put it that way, but I would say that the EIB is the financial arm of the EU. It finances European policies. It has played a very important role up to here and it should be key going forward because indeed it has the cap capability, the ability to mobilize large amounts of, of investment, public and private investment in the areas of the green transition, also the rebuilding of Ukraine and all other European priorities. So indeed I do think that we need an EIB which is fit for purpose to support European policies going forward. It's one thing having a vehicle for funding and it's another encouraging businesses to spend their own money. Is there a gap in that because we've still got the IRA and a lot of European companies we're talking to are now investing in the United States and so even startups that have seen their dynamics change. And I know a couple of big ones in France, for instance, that are hoped to be very homegrown in France and they wanted to take on the future and, you know, some of these companies from agri-tech to what you're seeing around renewables, but the financing doesn't work anymore because of inflation. So how do you incentivize European companies to stay here even with this big vehicle? Well, what I can do is share the experience we've had in Spain. We have la launched a massive reform and investment program thanks to the European Next Generation EU funds. And this is showing to be crowding in private investment. What we see is that we launched strategic projects in the area of electric vehicles or precision health or agri-tech, as you're, uh, you're indicating, or chips. And uh, this is actually attracting large private investments that see Spain as a great opportunity for them to set their bases and invest in R&D and the development of new technologies. So I do think there is a chance for us to crowd in private investment if we do things right. I am lovely to see you and I had the pleasure of speaking to Minister Ribera as well in, um, in COP28 in Dubai uh, and, and, and there was a similar kind of point that I was raising here is the speed of Europe transition, the speed of actually Europe getting stuff done. It's stunningly frustrated for you as a minister who wants to push ahead with a lot of reforms as well. It's stunningly frustrating for us watching this slow motion move. There are so many areas where Europe, I have to say it, Minister, fails to move quickly enough. And it's mostly in looking at itself and seeing what we can do better. And now we have parliamentary elections coming in June as well, so everything's going to shut down very, very quickly as people get into electioneering as well. I just think Europe could just do so much better, whether it's qualified voting, whether it's reform of uh, capital markets union, we're still talking about, whether it's actually allocating that money that you and Karen were talking about. Why are we so slow, Minister? Well, you're really preaching to the converted. <laughs> you know, as you probably know, Spain has been supporting qualified majority voting for almost everything. We have been driving and pushing for energy market reform. We have been leading uh, the uh, recent agreement on artificial intelligence regulation. So we are usually a quite dynamic country trying to push for uh, faster action. And I, I also, uh, you know, one of my priorities when I get to the European Investment Bank will be to see how to speed up procedures, how to make the institution linear, um, not leaner, but you know, more efficient in, in funding public and private investment. But, uh, you know, uh, we also have a European Union with 27 member states and it is a complex uh, construction, but still it leads the green transition in the world. It has a leading role in many of today's debates and I think this leading role should be preserved going forward. It's a lead, it, it does have 27 states, which gets me thinking about the incompletion of the project, but I don't want to go over old source. Mm. Another amazing conversation I had in Dubai, I spoke to so many amazing people, with uh, Jin Lee Kun, who is uh, mm. your equivalent at the AIIB, or will, certainly will be your equivalent. And, and, and I put it to him that someone had said to me that we need a Bretton Woods moment for the MDBs, for the multilateral development banks as well. How do you respond to that, 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 that quest that actually we need a reinvigoration of the MDBs to act as that catalyst for global growth and for that climate transition? Well, I have no doubt that we need to reinforce our global safety net. Actually, I've been for the last two years chairing the IMFC, which is the advisory committee on the board of the IMF. And we have been actually debating how to reinforce the multilateral development banks. Bretton Woods took place 80 years ago, yeah. and uh, it was obviously a key element underpinning the global orders for the last 80 years. But there is a new reality around us, and there are new global powers that also want to have a stronger voice in what's in shaping the future and uh, I think it will be very important in the coming months and years 
that we do reinforce and update our international safety net so that it is fit for purpose. Uh, and just, 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 uh, and, and absolutely spot on. And, and some of those new global powers, to be honest, don't have the same view of liberal democracy that we have as well. So mm. they, mm. unfortunately, despite the, the, the need to work together, we will be working as rivals with some nations uh, because they have just a different outlook on life. But, but, it, but in terms of galvanising the private sector as well. The trillions of dollars that are available, trillions and trillions of dollars that are available to back up what the AIIB, the EIB and the other MDBs are doing as well. Do you have a, I was going to say secret source, do you have a, an idea of how you're going to do this? Well, to start with, I think that we need to cooperate more closely. I think that the network of multilateral development banks has a formidable ability to mobilize public investment and also to support private investment, as I was saying, you know, by de-risking, by public-private cooperation. And I think that we need to articulate better the way we cooperate with a view to really having the best, the, the largest impact from the large amounts of money that also the, the public sector is putting into these institutions. We are making progress in that direction, and I think the, the coming months and years are going to be a key uh, to shape the world of the future in a direction, and let me pick up on, on what you said, in a direction that supports also democracy, that supports uh, human rights and respect uh, for minorities, and all those rights and values that we cherish uh, in Europe and, and in the US, of course. Yeah. So many questions on different topics, so let me try a few. AI, uh, some of the uh, tech industry professionals not happy with the new AI regulation, uh, the move to regulate foundation models. They say that's just going to mean more lawyers, less engineers. Do you think you've overstepped on AI regulation given it's still in its infancy? No, I don't think so. I think that we've reached the right, the right balance because, yes, some uh, part of the industry may not want to have any regulation whatsoever, but, uh, you know, citizens are also expecting the, the public sector to ensure that the development and the innovation in this area is going to preserve human rights, our values, and actually go in the direction of improving humankind's uh, living conditions, you know. And from this point of view, I think that we've struck the right, the right balance because there is a different, there is proportionality in the rules for smaller players and for large platforms. There, we are going step by step, starting with artificial intelligence having to show that something, a picture, a video, is, uh, has been cr created through artificial intelligence, you know, to start with. So I think we're going step by step, and it is a very important step forward so that Europe is also leading standard setting at global level. Are you worried it again reinforces the magnificent seven that you've got stocks that are going to grow stateside, not in Europe, that are effectively this is the moment where you could see breakthrough from European AI companies, but they'll be hampered by the regulation? Well, I think that, you know, this debate took place when we adopted the, the general data protection regulation. And many people said, well, you co companies are, are going to abandon Europe. And actually, that has become the global standard. And I think it's going to be something similar in, in artificial intelligence. But I agree, we need a global standard. And that's why it's important that the United Nations is also looking into these issues and that we bring global fora to try to standard set and to, to regulate these in a manner which ensures that we can trust artificial intelligence developments throughout the world. Let me switch to home territory, Spain. Uh, Bank of Spain forecasting GDP growth this year of 2.3%. So the economy is in good shape. It's seen to be one of the fastest growing in Europe next year as well. Do you need a, a bank tax? Do you need to be taxing the banks <laughs> at this point? The Bank of Spain governor was saying you should look at uh, some of the, the issues too around preserving capital. And we talk about investments for the future and provisioning as well. Is it time the bank tax was lifted? Well, this, this was imposed a couple of years ago when we needed to fund the extraordinary, extraordinary support measures to respond to the impact of the war in Ukraine. Uh, of course, between now and, and in the coming uh, months, we're going to decide what to do with that and the tax on the extraordinary windfall profits of energy companies. This has proven to be a right decision because it has provided uh, pub public revenues, you know, to the to the fiscal side. But also, it gives a sense of fairness to citizens, you know, that those that have extraordinary profits are contributing more. And I think it is very important to preserve social peace in our societies these days. Now, we will reflect and we will take the, the best possible decision. But if there are no extraordinary windfall profits, there wouldn't be any tax receipts, you know. So I think the system is already sort of uh, equilibrating or getting to a balance itself uh, with the natural development of how markets are going to evolve in the coming months. Minister, um, and I take on board what you and Karen just said about Spain's economy doing relatively robustly compared with mm. large parts of Europe as well. But it doesn't change the fact that actually 
Spain, like everyone else, is breaching the Stability and Growth Pact. 111% uh, debt to GDP, give or take, and I'm sure mm. we can debate about the individual number. It, it is not an uncommon number throughout Europe at the moment as well. I don't know if the Stability and Growth Pact has been fit for purpose up to date. And that's why Mr Gentiloni, poor Mr Gentiloni, I say that because he's been working so hard for so long on this and he keeps getting derailed by another crisis. And I've seen the man <laughs> labouring so hard. But, but I just think any compromise deal, is it, it's going to recognise where we are now roughly, but is it going to have any stick, any more stick than the pact had originally? I hope that we will get to an agreement by year's end. Uh, as you know, Spain currently is chairing the, the Council of Ministers. We had a very intense discussion last week. It was very productive. We're almost there. We can see that there, there can be an agreement by, year, by the end of the year, and I will, do, you know, I will devote all my energy uh, to get that agreement done. So you say 95% there? That was the number? Is it 95%? I would say you know, above 90% in okay. any case. You know, and in <laughs> September, we were around 70 So, And all ministers agreed we were above 90%. You know, so I do think that it is feasible. It is not easy. We're talking about very difficult negotiation. But I am confident we can have an agreement so that we can have the rules we need right now that ensure fiscal discipline and at the same time support growth, investment and, and but, job creation. But, and, oh, sorry. sorry, Minister. I, no. I, 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 time is of the essence. But, yeah. but, but the first people to break this, everyone knows this by now, was the Germans and the French. And mm. since then, everyone's just broken the rules left, right and centre. By reducing the budget, the, the, the overall debt to GDP by 1% a year from some of the numbers across Europe, it's not going to touch the sides on the overall picture and prepare us for the next crisis, is it? Well, this is not the general rule. And uh, coming back to your previous question, let me tell you that in Spain we have reduced uh, debt to GDP ratios by 15 points since the height in the, 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 the top in the first quarter of 2021 due to the pandemic. And we will be going down, the deficit to GDP ratio will go down to 3% next year. So we are strongly committed to fiscal discipline. And I think that's why we're, we're also in a very good position to lead this debate in the, in the European Union. But what you're referring to is a safeguard. You know, it's like a minimum for all countries. But there will be specific plans uh, limiting the increase of expenditure, public expenditure, uh, with, a, with a specific approach to each and every country. So that's the, that's the core of the new system. And then you have some safeguards to ensure that there is indeed debt reduction, that there is a, a margin below the 3% deficit um, um, threshold. So I do think that the new rules would, would make sense. They mm. would be better. And I hope that we reach an agreement before the end of the year. Minister.